WROI, WROI FM.com. Streaming audio live, RTC Channel 5, and we'll soon have audio and video on RTC Channel 4. Elizabeth, welcome back. Hello. You're becoming a standard feature of the radio station. Great. Yeah, there you go. John Alley, of course, our guest right now, the president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Good morning. Does she have her own coffee cup yet? Uh, you know she does not. Yep. But you need to fix is, that. I do, I do. She oh. does. I do. All right, she does. <laughs> She's official. Hey, she's, then, that's right. <laughs> we'll add her to the list. Yes, that's right. put her on the payroll. Yep, exactly. Anyway, the trustees of Woodlawn Hospital in session yesterday. Yes, had uh, you know, our board meeting. Again, we're kind of still in that in between time it's kind of our slow time as we you know looking at projects so just kind of did some update one of the questions was anything major that we might have coming up as far as a capital expenditure about the only big thing we've really got is our cooling towers which supplies the basically the air conditioning for the okay. hospital are fairly old and, and very inefficient right now and they've developed some minor leaks so we've been you know kind of fixing and repairing and limping them along but this fall we're probably gonna have to do some repair major repair or replacement and when you start looking at the cost to repair you put a few more thousand dollars with it and you get a new one so we're probably going to lean more toward replacement of those currently have two uh, cooling towers proposal one from one company was let's just put one big one in part of me says I, I yeah that makes sense but the other part says if i have two like i do now if one happens to break down i still have redundancy so i've got a second one as a backup so we're going to be weighing those options to see you know do we want to go with one big tower two small ones that we've got now and then the cost uh, there is some efficiency by buying one tower instead of two but again from an emergency standpoint i'd lose part of my flexibility if i go to one Fairly major. We got to wait till it gets fall of the year because we, you know we can't take the cooling out of the hospital, and that's the only way we cool. So we got to kind of watch the weather and, and not wait too late in the year where it's starting to freeze, but late enough that we're not going to need you know a massive amount of cooling. So kind of that little fine line. Once you pick that date, you've got to get it done fairly quickly, just in case you have some warm days. Are there a lot of companies that do this kind of work, John? We've got about four companies that okay. we've gotten quotes from. Um, I'm guessing there's more, but again, you know, you start expanding your search area out we can find more but we try to like keep as local as we can uh talking companies like fort wayne south bend indianapolis okay. nothing really you know right here in rochester that has the capability to put in something like that because it, it does require you know a crane and everything else to take the old ones out put the new ones in so that's probably the biggest thing we've got coming up for the board and it's you know they kind of what's the ballpark cost and i'm going uh you know it could be up to three four hundred thousand okay. dollars it just depends on what method we go with there's some new materials that's kind of interesting there's a, a plastic one now that has a uh, you know additive to the plastic to prohibit you know the growth of bacteria and mold but again what's the life of that it's fairly new so you don't know is that a, a 10 year a 15 year or a five year so a lot of research we've got to get done uh, brian crawford director of our maintenance uh is doing all that Kind of giving me you know, the high level. He starts getting into cubic feet per minute and stuff. I don't understand that. So uh, <laughs> kind of give me the, the, the basic 30,000 foot view, and then we'll take that to the board and make the decision. You know, what company you want to go with, one unit, two units, and what's that cost going to be? So The ones we're replacing are the originals? So one is an original. One is okay. probably about 15 years old. But the, the one has been there a long time, and, you know, we've done a lot of maintenance and repairs to it. And, and it's one of those, oh, can we get another year? Can we get another year? And we've done that for the past at least five or six years. And uh, we're to the point we can't get that another year out of it. It, it is at end of life. So we're going to have to do something major there. John, when you're talking about capital projects, one of the things you and I have talked about over the last year or so, uh, the possibility of redoing some of the rooms at Woodlawn Hospital. Yeah, that's still in the works. Um, again, we're kind of, once we do... You know, the major like this, that takes some of my funds away. So we're still planning on that room renovation. And the other part is, every time we think we have a final plan, there's a new regulation or something comes out, you know, from uh, one of the regulatory bodies that changes that a little bit. So we're still kind of mulling that over. It's, it's uh, healthcare is kind of like Indiana weather. Wait two hours and it changes. Um, so when you think you've got all the answers, somebody comes up and says, no, you can't do that anymore. So that's been one of the frustrating points is, you know, what are some of the finer regulations? And we just did a, a fairly major uh, renovation to our pharmacy department to bring it up to their standards. We had it done about three months and they said, oh, wait a minute. 
there's another one we forgot. So now we have to look, can we grandfather in what we've got? Or do we have to re, you know, renovate that again? That's the frustrating part is that you just get one thing done and then they come back and say, well, we forgot this. Well, to go back and retrofit something you just totally remodeled is more expensive than if you had done it to start with. So, you know, we're trying to say, can we grandfather some of this stuff in? And we met your standards of this date. You changed it here. You know, can we kind of go forwards in? Some you can, some you can't. Okay. And that's kind of the, you know, the, I guess the frustration I've got is it's it's hard to keep on top of all this because it changes, like I say, every hour it seems like something changes that we we're working toward an endpoint based on the information we had. And then midstream, we got to change the direction again. And anytime you do that, it costs more money because you got to stop what you're doing. You got to retool, rethink, and, and go forward. So, you know, a lot of the high cost of health care is, is kind of it's self perpetuating from the government. They keep changing things and it costs us more money. John, you mentioned uh, the pharmacy, and here a year or two ago, we were talking about the shortage of pharmaceuticals and pharmacy drugs that uh, are, are pretty basic. Has that resolved itself it now? It has pretty well resolved itself. Okay. You know, I think at that point, we were talking, I had uh, five or six, eight and a half, eleven, two-column pages of drugs <laughs> that were either not available or on the, you know, the right. shortage list. We're down just, I think, three or four now, and, uh, you know, that's... Some of that you can understand. Lots of times we'll get the shortage because they're retooling at the manufacturing. So, you know, the cynical old accountant and myself <laughs> says that's, you know, a planned shortage to right. just to bump the price back sure. up again. You know, some of it was due to some of the hurricanes and when it devastated Puerto Rico. That was a major production and storage area for a lot of the, the drugs and uh, IV fluids. So when that happened, that, that source was gone. And fortunately, FDA, you know, knew that was an issue and give some temporary approval to some drugs from Europe okay. and some IV solutions. That's pretty well resolved itself now. So we're in pretty good shape. We continue to watch that because, again, we want to know if in four months there's going to be a shortage of a certain item can we stockpile that now if it's an item that we use a lot of so the you know much like everybody else our poor pharmacist is constantly looking what's the upcoming predicted shortages and it, you know it's kind of like uh, throwing the dice you know do you gamble and order some now because you really don't know if it's really going to happen but you know there's some of these you know little chat groups say hey we're noticing where it's harder to get this or get that once that hits, then everybody starts stockpiling, so now you've got the shortage again. So it's a, it's a gamble. Do you buy some now or do you wait? Uh, it was kind of odd. Lots of times the stuff we couldn't find on our primary markets, uh, you could find a lot of it on the secondary market. Now, the secondary market the price is like four to five times what you pay on your primary. So sure. you often wonder you know, who's running the secondary markets also. So, again, the old account, I mean, you know, we're always cynical and we, we, we question some of those things. Again, John Alley, our guest, he's president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, and uh, other notes from the trustees? Yeah, other notes. Uh, one of the things that we've done, we're constantly looking to, you know, what can we do to improve availability patient care? And uh, we've had several years, you know, two cardiac groups into the in the hospital, one from South Bend and one from Indianapolis. We were approached by the uh, cardiology department out of Lutheran doing some outreach. And so hopefully starting August 1st, We'll add another day into our cardiology department with uh, the physicians from Lutheran Health Network. And it's a fairly, you know, extensive program they have up there. And uh, so, again, that just kind of expands our availability, gives a, one more day for our physicians to make referrals to. Plus, it's one less day a patient has to drive somewhere else to get their care. So we're excited about getting them okay. coming on board August 1st. Um, you know, I think it's going to be a very good thing for the community. Again, kind of ups our bar a little bit on what we have to offer as far as cardiology. And, you know, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of that is, you know, people, uh, lifestyles cause cardiac issues. Uh, just, you know, we don't take care of ourselves. Heart and disease is still the number heart one. Heart disease is still, you know, a major factor in a lot of things. So if we can help folks either through prevention or treatment, that's what we need to do. Yeah. So I'm very excited about being able to expand that department, add one more day. Uh, their comment was, well, if they, they see it's successful, they might like to do two days here. So if I could get four to five days cardiac coverage, I mean, that would be a major uh, improvement for what we can offer our patients and you know families in Fulton and surrounding counties is 
You don't have to drive to Fort Wayne, South Bend, Indianapolis. You can come here and see your cardiologist. So uh, very excited about that program. Will they be positioned in Woodlawn Hospital itself? Yes, they'll be just right next door to our physical therapy department. We've got a little area there that is our cardiac area. And uh, they come in and they rent space from us. So, you know, no, we're not being bought by Lutheran. (laughs) Stop that right now. Let's do. Yeah. uh, (laughs) But, uh, you know, much like the care group and Beacon, they both rent space from us. So, you know, that uh, allows them at office space. We provide them some support staff. And they have three exam rooms, a physician's office, and then they can do treadmills and whatever testing they need to do. So it's right there off our physical therapy, nice and convenient private waiting room so you're not you know you're you're sitting there so again uh just really i'm excited about being able to offer one more day hopefully we can make that so we got at least four to five days per week coverage i don't think we'll ever get to the point where we have weekend coverage but if we can get you know five day of coverage for cardiology that is really important for a community like this Does that have to be recommended from your personal physician, or can you, as a person, just call the cardiologist? Most of these are recommendations. You need a referral from your family physician. So you've gone to see your family doctor, and they've they've picked up something. Go, hey, I think we got a cardiac issue going here. Then they do the referral, get the appointment for you, and then you go see the cardiologist. Got it. Finally, got into the financials for the month. Uh, For the month of May, we had gross revenue about thirteen point two million. Our good old deductions from revenue, we wrote off a little over eight million in that. Had some other operating revenue of 112,000, so give us you know cash to work with, so to speak, of 5.2 million for the month, and then we got into our expenses and we spent 4.9 million of that. So we actually had a net income of the month of uh, 505,000. So I had an operational profit for the month, which is we're a little early. This usually I don't start seeing those until more you okay. know, late second quarter, early third quarter. So I'm okay. I you know it's it's beneficial start building some of those cash reserves back up so we can reinvest back into the hospital. One of the other things that we're starting this year is, and as I explained, healthcare is changing, it seems like, you know, constantly. It's time for us to kind of look at uh, reflection, where we want to be the next three to five years. Good point. So we're, we're kind of looking at that rebranding of the hospital. Uh, what do we want to do? So we started kind of some of that today with our leadership group saying, you know, come late August, early September, we're going to kind of take a retreat uh, and get everybody out of the building. I'm going to confiscate all their cell phones when they come in <laughs> so there's no distractions. And let's sit down and, you know, what do we want to do? Where do we want to be in three to five years? There's some, you know, three major things that from an administrative perspective we've looked at. They're obtainable, but they're going to take some work. Uh, we want to be a, a, a certified chest pain center. Because, again, now if I can get the cardiac sure. coverage there, why not go ahead and get that extra step now Absolutely. We'll, where we can be certified as a chest pain center? Along with that, we want to get certified as a stroke care center. So we're working with, again, the stroke care network to do that. And then the final thing is going to take some time, and it's probably at least three to four years out, is recently uh, Indiana County kind of opened up their trauma center designation. They've always had one, twos, and threes. They've now opened up a level four uh, designation. We're real close to be able to be designated as a level four trauma center, which would mean right now there's some protocols put in by the state of Indiana that if you have a certain mechanism of injury, you have to go to a trauma center. So we're having patients transferred from here, Fort Wayne, South Bend, to the trauma centers. And there's been times when I've got the complaint that the patient says I'm waiting in the waiting room of the ER up there for my family to come pick me up. But the EMS followed their protocol because of the mechanism of injury. If we would could designate as a level four, some of those, and we would, about 20%, probably could stay here. We could evaluate, treat, stabilize, and then if they need to be transferred, transferred. Otherwise, they could stay here. So that's going to take you know three years or so to do that. But that's, again, part of our strategic plan. Can we do that? And, uh, you know, part of me says... Try it. If it fails or if you can't do it, say fine, but at least we tried. And uh, so there's a lot of a lot of excitement. It's kind of, you know, we're, we're wanting to re, you know, rebrand the hospital, so to speak. And, you know, the, the, it keeps coming up. Can we become a regional center of excellence? And my mind says, yes, we can, but okay. we've got to work at it. So that's kind of our plan. We want to become a regional center of excellence here in in Fulton County. What uh, additional things would you have to do to be a level four trauma center? A lot of it has to do with uh, the availability of surgeons, both uh, general surgery and orthopedic surgery. We've got them on call now, but part of that is, you know, uh, one of the things to remember for a general surgery is if a trauma patient is identified, they need to be on site when the ambulance gets there. So that means we'd have to have somebody fairly close that could be at the hospital within 30 minutes. 
we're, we're almost there. Uh, there's some other minor okay. policies and procedures that we and staff we'd have to have in place, but we need to look at it because it, you know that would make a difference not only to the hospital but to a lot of those patients that are you know, being transferred, and rightly so given the current protocols with EMS. But they probably, if we had that designation here, they could probably stay here. So again, something that's that's okay. top of my wish list. That you know, I'm thinking probably fifty percent probability of happening, but. Got to look at it. We, we can't just, oh, we can't do that and move on. We've got to look at those type things, find better ways to do everything. And I, I tell our staff, there's a better way to do everything we do. We just don't know what it is yet. So we got to investigate, try. If it doesn't work, don't do it again, but move on to the next thing. And let's find what we can do to make us better as we move forward. Uh, we want to really get back to, to a patient-centered environment. We were there at a point, and then you kind of get away from it when you get tied up and, and your mind gets around this regulation, that regulation. All of a sudden, we became more administratively focused. And, well, we can't, no, we got to get back to patient-centered. We'll make the rest work. The patient has to come first, has to be the main purpose, our main focus. The administrative and the paperwork, we'll figure that out. Let's get back to patient-centered. So uh, that's kind of our new marching orders that we're going to look at and work on for the rest of this year. Start 2020 to make some of those transitions. And it's going to be two to three years because you can't change some culture. You can't change it overnight. It's going to take time, but we're going to get there. Let's get our roadmap put together now. So as we move forward, we know where we want to be and have our milestones in place. For the most part, though, Woodlawn patients are very satisfied. Very with Woodlawn satisfied. Hospital. Yes, and again, you know, if we're at ninety percent, I want us to be at ninety-five percent. <laughs> if we're at ninety-five, you know, as as a true administrator, we need to be at ninety-eight. Uh, so that's what we're doing. You know, there's again, we can do things better. We do really, really good now. But we can fine-tune, I think, still do some better things to make that experience for the patient and their families better than what it is today. Once we stop trying to make ourselves better, you know, that, that's the end, to, to me, of an organization. Once you stop trying to grow, you become stagnant, then, then everything else fails. So we've got to continue to grow, continue to be better. John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, and that pretty well concluded the that board meeting. That was pretty well the board else, right? meeting, yes. All right. Next month, what are you going to do? Boy, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think probably then we'll probably really be starting in the preliminary of our budget process. Right. We usually try to start doing that late June, mid-July. So, uh, you know, some of that stuff will be coming up, getting feedback from, uh, again, from the board. They're an integral part of this whole strategic plan of our three to five years, where we need to be. The nice part about them is they're not in that building every day. So they have a whole different perspective and mindset than what we do. That's I need that too. Okay, from your perspective on the outside looking in, where do you want us to be? What is your thoughts? What is your plans? We need to incorporate that into this three to five year strategic plan because you know they're kind of the that's why they're there. They're the representatives of the community to direct the hospital where we need to go. So we'll be giving them some homework. They'll have to get you know some of that done, and uh, you know start melding all these ideas and, and thoughts together. Come up with a, a workable document, and then that'll be kind of our roadmap. And it's going to be in pencil because we know as we go, it's going to change. But at least we've got a starting point and we an end point. What happens in between is going to be very fluid and dynamic. It's going to have to change. And but uh, again, I'm excited. It's it's going to be. I think it'll be fun. Again, John Alley, President and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Thanks very much for stopping by, sharing with us about the board meeting. But uh, thanks for thanks for taking care of the people of. Fulton and the surrounding counties at Woodlawn Hospital. Yeah, it's, you know, I've said it before, is that I've surrounded myself with outstanding people, and they make me look very good, make my job very easy. But we got to continue to do that. And again, patients absolutely come first and foremost. We'll make the rest work. we got to take care of them. John Alley, thank you very much. Thank you. 